group in Australia, just a church group, City of Light, uh, known all over the world now, listened to by people all over the world. And they wrote that song after uh, two, three years of brutal lockdowns in Australia, where there are. And after all of that, of having their church shut down and uh, silenced and uh, not allowed to leave their homes and just oppressive medical tyranny that never should have been, um, forced things on them, uh, arrested and slammed to the ground. Still, they can say, I will rejoice no matter what comes my way. And so we can claim that too. No matter what comes our way, we can rejoice because Christ is the one who's with us. So let's open with prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our leader, be our teacher, uh, be the God that resides within us, that will teach us and lead us into all truth. Give us that strength to obey your truth and to follow you in whatever you call us to do. And this message today, Lord, help us to see your overwhelming power and the glory and the majesty and all of the intelligence that you have to keep this whole universe running. So we look to you and we praise you and thank you and want you to receive all of the glory and all of the praise for everything that is said and done. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. So today we're in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 19 and 20, talking about the creation of God and how the people of this world don't want to hear it, how the people of this world deny it. Uh, the truth that the Bible spells out is that God created the heavens and the earth, all of it. He did it in six 24-hour days. He rested on the seventh day. And he did it about 6,000 years ago. And for most of that time, people believed that. Adam and Eve didn't think that the earth evolved. <laughs> they know who made them. They know who made everything. God himself was personally there, planted the Garden of Eden for them, told them they can eat of all these wonderful trees that he had made. They didn't doubt that. I heard a, uh, a testimony about uh, Spurgeon's life, the great English uh, preacher. And every time they built a bigger church for him, they would quickly fill it and have to big another one. Kept building them bigger and bigger, and it kept getting filled up. And everybody wanted to go hear Spurgeon speak in person. And, and he was just a, a, you know, a moving force for God that God was using mightily. And then in 1859, Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species. And it made Christians doubt that God is the creator. It made him doubt the Bible. And the, the, he didn't need any more bigger churches because his attendance started falling off. And it's something I never knew was that that greatly affected him. And, and from that point, he was kind of on a downward spiral in his whole ministry. All because of one man that made bold, great statements, not based upon science in any way whatsoever, but claimed to be. No, there is no creator. It all happened by chance. It's all a mistake, really. You, you had everything in the world created from nothing. And when something that was nothing exploded, it all turned into something. And it's just nonsense. It's insanity. And so it is. And, and now we have Christian scientists who were able to really... Uh, look into an electron microscope and then look into a great big telescope and look into the heavens and down to the atoms and see absolutely it was made in a point of time and it's not that old. Yet the lies continue, the lies go on. And now you have the world's leaders, uh, a lot of them making bold statements, no, there is no God. And we have to take control of our world, we have to make sure it lasts and is sustainable and and the planet's most important. We've got to protect that. They're just working against the truth. The truth that God created this heavens and earth. That, that he, has in, he, he had a beginning for it and he has an end for it. And the earth is not going to be flooded with the water anymore. He said it wouldn't. 
And he said, you proud waves, you stop right here. That's why people that claim to believe in climate change and the earth is going to flood the coastlands like Obama, that's why he builds a house on the beach, on an island, because he knows there's no truth to climate change in what he's saying. And, and uh, Al Gore, one of the biggest proponents of it, and one of the guys that's getting riches off it because they're making money off this. He has a house in Malibu on the beach. Nancy Pelosi believes all this. She says she does. Then why does she build a house on the beach in Florida? You can go online and look at that big old house she has there right on the beach. Because they know this stuff isn't going to happen and it's not true. Yet they still, they deny the creator who already said, I'm not going to let the waters of the ocean go beyond what I told them that, where they have to stay. He's the one that said, I, I will make all of the seasons and, and the summer and the fall and the winter and the spring. I make them and they'll continue all the way up until the end comes. And the end is not that far away. The end of life on this earth as we know it. Uh, there's a big copper mine behind us and the roads that I walk up the hill, uh, every road that I walk up the hill, you go up a ways and you see their signs, private property. And there's the big mine and they're building copper mines to all the copper we're going to need for all the electric cars that are coming and going to fill the world. Well, golly, anybody almost that has a clear thinking brain can think that's a bunch of n nonsense. But the truth is that someday God is going to burn up the whole heavens and the whole earth. And I don't think this investment is going to work out for them. The world has plans, but they're not the plans of God. They have their deadlines. And it's interesting that the World Economic Forum had Agenda 21, or the United Nations had Agenda 21, and that was for the 21st century. Then they came out with a more precise one, Agenda 30, because by 2030, all these things and goals of theirs are going to be accomplished. They claim that everybody on earth will own nothing and will have zero privacy and will just love it. What kind of drugs are they going to be giving people? <laughs> That's what I want to know. And, um, they make these wild claims. They say this will be the last generation of human beings because now we will all transform into half machine and half human and will be our own gods and live forever. Seems like I heard all those lies from Satan in the garden already to Eve. Oh, you'll be like gods. Oh, you'll live forever. Well, you won't die. Yeah, right. So the, the world is going towards where God said it would in the Bible. Exactly. A, a one world government where the government has total control of your money, where you can't buy or sell anything without their stamp of approval of having a mark on your right hand or your forehead, the mark of the beast. Well, isn't it interesting that right now the big push are all around the world, and in our country it's huge, to have a one ID that will be used for everything. And we'll also have one digital currency with one bank. No longer will you see banks along the road. They'll all be gone. There's no use for them. No more paper or coin money. Everything will be digital. Everything is programmable. They will use a system similar that China has with their, uh, their social credit score. So if the government likes what you say and, and if the government sees you taking steps to agree with homosexuality and transgenderism and if you're promoting that and pushing that, then, then you'll be able to buy a lot of stuff. But if you don't, well, they'll just turn your money off. Or if they say, well, you, you exceeded your gasoline limit for the week, for the month. And you go to the pump and you put in your idea, it won't work. Total control of our money. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. Same thing. And the system and the mindset is being set up for that right now. Totally without a creator who says, hey, I have a much different ending. Where Satan and all the evil people are burning in hell forever. And all of the people that trust Christ to their Savior from Adam and Eve all the way till the end will be glorified in, with Christ in heaven forever. Having perfect bodies and having God right there with us in his glory illuminating the whole new heavens and earth that he's going to make. We're heading on a totally different track and so is God. But 
He told us that what's going to happen, and we see it shaping up now, and it's a world that doesn't recognize God as the creator. In, in spite of all of the scientific absolute proof that everything was made from a point in time designed by a creator, and it's not that old, they say, no, none of that is true. It's not scientific. Well, they're liars. Evolution is impossible. Some of the things that, golly, I've never heard these before, some of these. Some of the things that our planet is doing. How much energy, how much work does it take to keep our planet going every day? When I meet with the kids uh, here on Tuesday and Wednesday in their Bible study, I start out every day and I say, good morning. And they all say, good morning. And I say, what is today? And then now almost all of them will raise their hand. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And, and I'm asking them every day, and I've been asking it for months, and, and I want them to learn that, that God makes today. He's the one that keeps the planet turning around. How do you have the planet just hanging here? And th that it came from an explosion of nothing. It's just absurd. So just some facts about our planet, and this is taken from John MacArthur's commentary on the book of Romans. He says, at any given time, there's an average of 1,800 storms operating in the world at one time. And I've seen pictures of the Earth taken from satellites where you can see the lightning um, just all over the world. There's lightning, thunderstorms happening everywhere. Uh, we hardly see any, but boy, they're happening in other parts of the world a lot. Any one time, 1,800 thunderstorms in operation around the world. The energy needed to generate these storms amount to incredible 1,300,000,000 horsepower. So the guys can get that. You know, you got a car with 300 horsepower, it's pretty good. How about 1,300,000,000 to operate one storm? We're going to get an idea of how big and powerful our God is. By comparison, a large earth-moving machine has 420 horsepower and re requires hundreds of gallons of fuel a day just to operate it. Just one of those storms producing rain four inches over an area, 10,000 square miles, would require energy equivalent to burning 640 billion tons of coal to evaporate enough water to make all of that rain. All the water is evaporating. In Lake Tahoe, it evaporates, they say, about a tenth of an inch every day. So when I was going kayaking, I would go every week, and I'd think, wow, it's gone down almost an inch every week. Well, how it requires energy to evaporate water. 640 billion tons of coal to evaporate that much rain? And to cool all the vapors that collects in the clouds and the sky from that one storm would take 800 million horsepower of refrigeration night and day for 100 days for one rainstorm. And there's 1,800 of them and on average going on around the world. Um, agricultural studies have determined that the average farmer in Minnesota gets 407,510 gallons of rainwater per acre per year and for free, although the government's trying to take that away too. And the state of Missouri has some 70,000 square miles and averages 38 inches of rain a year. The amount of water that is equivalent to the, a lake 250 miles long, 60 miles wide, and 22 feet deep. You know, kids in school are taught that the world's running out of water. How? How does it run out of water? Well, when, when, you know, when I grew up, it said, don't be a gutter flutter. So if your sprinkler was going and all the water was going down, the gutter, they had people that went out and patrolled and said, hey, well, well it's going down the gutter. Some of it's evaporating and going up into the clouds where it'll become rain again. And some of it goes down into the gutter, into the groundwater and the sewer system. The water in the world just keeps cycling. Uh, sometimes I say to my kids, look, at there's our next glass of water. And they'll say, where? And we're looking up in the sky. Well, it's a cloud. The cloud came from the ocean. 
all the salt water that you can't drink evaporates and it turns into a cloud and it gets over the land and it rains. Fresh water and it goes down into the groundwater where the wells are. God made a lot of water on this planet because we need it. He he made a lot of air because we need it. Everything we need is here. And he keeps it all going by his incredible power every single day. Uh, the, The U.S. Natural Museum has determined there are at least 10 million species of insects. Well, I know there's ladybugs. That's one. Uh, 10 million species of insects? Is God creative or what? Uh, 2,500 varieties of ants? In Tahoe, there's ones that were half red and half black. And the cats would sniff it and the thing would bite their nose. They learn real quick, don't sniff them. Those little buggers hurt. 2,500 varieties of ants? Five billion birds in the United States? Some of the species fly 500 miles nonstop from the Gulf of Mexico? A mallard duck can fly 60 miles an hour? When I was little, my dad told me he would drive down the road and ducks would pass him. He would be going like the speed limit. Eagles can fly 100 miles an hour, and a falcon can dive at speeds of 180 miles an hour. That's why the little birdie flying along gets hit at 180 miles an hour. That's what the falcon eats is other birds. They don't see it coming. The earth is 25,000 miles across, and it weighs, I'd never heard of these things, but this is how much it weighs, 6 septillion 588 sextillion tons. And it's just here in space, held by what? The Bible says that Jesus Christ upholds everything by his power. There's a powerful creator holding this planet out here. It spins at, how fast does the earth spin? 1,000 miles an hour, our earth is spinning around with absolute precision. And how fast is it going through space in its orbit around the sun? It's going at a speed of 1,000 miles per minute in its orbit around the sun. So do you feel like you're spinning at 1,000 and going through space at 1,000 miles a minute? And one orbit around the sun is 580 million miles long. And it just happened all by itself. No, an all-powerful God keeps it going. Can he help me make my car payment? Yes. <laughs> Can he provide all of my needs? Yes. We serve an amazingly strong God. Oh, this just keeps going on and on. How incredibly powerful God is to keep this world going. Yes, there is a God. He is a creator. And the people that say there's no such thing are fools. And I understand some of the uh, meaning of that word is insanity. They are insane. So we're going to look at this uh, passage today in just three points. God makes himself known to every person under the sun that's ever been born. Every person has no excuse for not knowing God. And that the God of the Bible did create the whole heavens and the earth and keeps it going. And he did it in six days, rested on the seventh, about 6,000 or so years ago. So it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, for what can be known about God? What can be known? What we're going to see is God uses several words here to show everybody that I've made it known, I've made it plain, you can see it, open your eyes, there it is. I read a little story about Helen Keller that I didn't know, who had some disease and she was born blind, she was born deaf, and she couldn't speak. And this lady came alongside of her and taught her to speak. And when the lady wanted to teach her about God, she started telling her about God. And Helen Keller, who couldn't see, couldn't hear, and couldn't speak, she said, oh, I already knew who he was. I just didn't know his name. His name was God. That's all. 
Because she, with those senses gone, could still perceive from this world that there is a God that made everything, an all-powerful one that keeps everything going. So what can be made known by God is capable of, of what is known. There, there's a great story in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, and I'll just tell it real quick. Uh, the apostles now, are, the church has been started, and the apostles are uh, doing their amazing preaching and miracles, and they're walking along, and here's a, bl- a beggar uh, that is lame, and he's been lame since birth, and everybody knows who this guy is. Everybody at some point maybe has given him some money. And he's looking at uh, Peter as he walks by, and they're just staring at him. And Peter says, hmm, you want money from me? Well, money from me. I'm going to tell you that I don't have any silver and I don't have any gold, but I do have something, and I'm going to give it to you. Rise, stand up, and walk. A man that has never walked in his life. So he takes him by the arm, and he stands him up, and he walks And his legs are instantly restored. And now he's jumping. (laughs) And everybody's seeing him. And they're all saying, isn't this the guy that we saw? That we everybody knew has been lame since birth. And now we're seeing him just jump all over the place. How incredible is this? So the religious leaders see this. And the religious leaders cannot stand this. And especially the Sadducees, because they hate resurrection and resurrection from the dead. They don't believe that. So they go to these men, and they say, we want to know by whose authority this guy has been healed and is hopping around here. And he says, okay, I'll tell you whose authority. It's Jesus Christ. And they say, you know, that's it. Because we know these guys haven't been taught, but they speak with such authority and in truth that they have to have been with Jesus. Okay, we get that. And then they tell him that we can see that this man was healed. And everybody else can see it. So we're afraid to do anything to these guys. So they just warned him. And they said, don't speak in Jesus' name anymore. But Peter responds to them. And he says, you can see the miracle that Christ did for this man and giving him uh, legs that, that can now not just walk but jump all over the place. God has made this very apparent and clear to all that he is a real God, that Jesus is the real God. And these men, the religious leaders, they couldn't couldn't do anything because everybody could see the power of God. And this word to see something is to see what God has done and then glorify God. God has made it plain. He has made uh, people to to be known. God is known. <laughs> and it's plain to them. The next word is plain. They, they can see. It's open. It's evident. When Jesus did his first miracle, that was the first one that he did that was seen. And he was glorified of that. And because his disciples saw what he did, and they, they could see it, they believed in him, that he is God and that he is the Savior, and they trusted in him. God has shown it to them, it says. So it can be known about God as plain, it's plain to them, and that God has shown it to everybody that he exists. And he's showing all of the people his creation. That word is used twice. He's showing it to them, and, and they saw it. It's perceived. It's perceived as something they can grasp and understand. It's something that's clearly perceived. That's the word to see. Then they put this little uh, word in front of it that just intensifies it. They can really see it. In these two verses, in 19 and 20, it's clear. It's plain. They can perceive it. They can see it. They can know it. (laughs) What more does God have to do? everything that they see in creation, they can determine that all of his invisible attributes, somebody very strong had to have made this earth. If somebody would 
I guess be so dumb is, is to take a Coke can and, and say, well, this Coke can, nobody made this and nobody designed it. What we did was put a bunch of uh, different color paint in a room in cans, and then we put a bunch of aluminum in that room, and we just left it there, and after a while, it turned into a Coke can. Well, that's stupid. It can't happen. Well, that's what the scientists that, that deny Christ and God as being the creator, that's what they're trying to say. Given enough time, everything will come together and all happen and, and turn into something. They say, for the most part, that everything came from a big bang, a big explosion, where nothing that was really something, and they can't explain where the nothing came from, exploded, and then it turned into everything that we see here today. Everything came, turned into seeds that grow, and, and that, that cattle that have little babies, and you see them in the fields all over here now. All that just happened by itself. You gotta be stupid to believe that. Yet the world's smartest scientists and professors and teachers and think that it's all true. It's crazy. God said, I've shown you from the time this world was created, from Adam and Eve, anybody can look at that and say somebody had to have designed this. Somebody had to have made this. And then he says, they're without excuse. They have no legal defense. That's what that word means. No defense in their case. They're guilty. And when they stand before God, and God says, and they're looking at God and Jesus Christ on the great white throne, I think is what exactly they're going to be looking at, looking at him. And they can't say, I didn't believe that you existed because of my science teacher in school. And his God is going to say to him, you're without excuse. You have no excuse. It's plain. And you knew it was me, but you hated me so much you denied me. And you wanted to get rid of me. No legal defense. So God has made it clear. And the God of the Bible, all through the Bible, the whole heavens and earth have been created by him. I found one little particular thing online where it just has a whole lot of verses about God creating the heavens and the earth. And, and this is, uh, these sheets here, there's just a little bit of him creating the heavens and the earth. When you look up the word creation, when you look up the word make, things like that, and you take a course and you start going through the Bible, there's way, way more than this. God is constantly telling people, I'm the creator. If he's the creator, he's the judge. Everybody is responsible to him and will have to face him someday. And the world does like anything to get that away. And even Christians, from the time that Darwin came out with his lies, have tried to fit his lies of billions of years and no creator into the Bible. It's called theistic evolution where they think, well, God made everything, but it took billions of years. He just let evolution take place. God knew this would happen. So every plant we see out here, all green, is getting us all his energy and all of the transformation that happens in every leaf and every tree and every plant, getting its energy from the sun. And without the sun, it will die. You can put plants inside and they grow as long as they have the right kind of light that's you know, same as the sun, they can grow. And if you take that light away, they die. So they say, well, it took millions of years because that's what science says. They're trying to put the world into the Bible and you can't do that. It's wrong. And it's also nonsense. So God says, well, I'm going to make all of the plants. And on the next day, I'm going to make the sun. So all of the plants were existing without the sun for one day. Well, they can handle that. And God made it, so it'll work. But when they try to say, well, each one of those days was a period of millions of years. So all of the plant life on the planet existed millions of years without the sun? How can this be? <laughs> it's not possible. So in, in Genesis 1, it states that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and that's it. That's true. That's how it, everything got here. In John 1, 3, it says, all things were made through Christ. And without him was not anything made that was made. 
So if something was made, it was made by him. And nothing could say, well, I was made without him. No. It's popular to say, well, there's alien species that evolve way beyond us, and they're far reaches of the universe, and they're going to come back and tell us that, well, the Bible's all lie, and God's really not true, but Satan is, and New Age thinking, that's all true. Well, you can ask them the question, where did the aliens come from? If they didn't come from God, well, they came from other aliens. Where did those aliens come from? And you can just keep going there and going and going. Where did they come from? Well, I don't want to talk about that anymore. A person once told me, I kept asking, where did those aliens come from? Ah, I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> Everything came from God and nothing that was made. Jesus Christ is the one that made it all. Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created in heaven and in earth. Everything that's visible, all the things that are invisible, all the spirit world, the angelic world, the demonic world whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, all things were created through him. And everything was created for him, all for the glory of God, everything. At the very end of, of human history, when John uh, the Apostle has these visions and, and sees things, and he writes it all down in the book of Revelation, and he sees this throne situation where everybody's worshiping and singing to God. And this is what they're saying, that Jesus Christ is worthy. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why is that? For you created all things, and by your will they all existed and they were created. God wanted to, so he made everything. So there's Christians today, including the former president of the Southern Baptist, which I heard on, a, on his radio program that he had, question and answer program. He says that creation is one of those things that is not that important, that it really doesn't matter. And some people, Christians, believe it was millions of years. According to what science says, that's what he said. You know, he says, I lean more towards the, you know, the, the six days maybe. But, you know, huh. he didn't say God made it in six days because the Bible said he did. He just said, well, you know, maybe not. I don't know. It's not that important anyway. So when I heard that, I thought, now, where, what part of the Bible is the stuff that isn't that important? Where do I go to find that? There isn't anything... Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word is important. And because in the heaven, they're all singing, worthy are you, God, because you made everything. That's how important it is. And then in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we all exist. We all exist for him, whether we like it or know it or not. When we become believers, we want to exist for him. Our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Repeating what it said in John 1, 3. That in Nehemiah, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their hosts. All, all of the angels and all of the stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve them all. And the host of heaven, they'll worship you. The host of heaven are the angels. And when John was talking to an angel, when he was writing the book of Revelation, the angel is so incredible and telling these amazing things that John starts to bow down and worship him. And the angel says, never do that. Because I too am a servant of God and I worship him. And he looks at John and he says, worship God. It's, we worship him because he made everything. Because he's God. And then our verse here in Romans 20, all of his invisible attributes, all of his power, his eternal power, his divine nature, he is God, he is deity. 
It's been clearly perceived since the creation of the world. All things that have been made, people are without excuse. In Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth of God that God has created. They changed it all for a lie. Evolution is a lie. To say that God didn't create the heavens and the earth is a lie. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the, and the first morning and evening, that was the first day. And then the second day. And then the third day. And then later on, God tells the Jewish people, I want you to work six days and rest on the seventh. Because I created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. And if each one of those days is millions of years long, like some Christians think, it we don't live millions of years. <laughs> we live 70, 80, 90, 100, or whatever. Each day was a literal day, 24-hour day. The Bible says so, so clearly. And people try to manipulate and, and change words, meaning, and things, trying to get it to mean that there are periods of time, and that's impossible. Uh, Psalm 33 Six, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. What kind of power is that? Say, let there be light, and all of a sudden, everything's light. And there's not even a sun and moon yet. Have you thought about this ever? What was there before the world was created? What was there? And... Some of the kids, school kids, I asked, they said, well, everything was dark. But the Bible says that God is light, and in him is no darkness. So you think, what was here before he created everything? The angels, the sky, the universe, the stars? There was light. He's light. That's all he is. No darkness in him. And he just speaks, and light comes into being. He speaks, let the earth Sprout forth vegetation, all to grow from their seeds. And, and all these plant variations and trees all over the world are instantly there. Hey, the big question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? That's easy. God said, let all the animals appear on the same day that he made man. All the animals appear, the chickens appeared. And then they laid eggs. That was the system that God set up. And you know what? Everything's still going in that direction. Why is the government trying to get rid of all of our eggs? I'm not going to even go there. <laughs> Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. And we are all the work of your hand. God is a potter and he creates each one of us. Amazing God that we have. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. They declare it. It, it, it says there, there's no audible, audible sound of them shouting, but they're still shouting. When you look up at the stars, it's so amazing of how many stars we can see. I think the scientists say maybe like 3,000 stars we look up in the sky. But uh, there's really billions and trillions of them. Light years. 186,000 miles a second. And there's billions of light years to go to other stars and other galaxies. There's billions of galaxies. And God made it all. He keeps every one of those things working. All the stars are shining bright. When I was a little boy, when we, would, we used to sleep outside a lot in the summer. And uh, when I'd wake up and it was still dark, and I would think, wow, I wonder what time it was. And I would think, I always picked the Big Dipper and thought, well, the Big Dipper was like here or wherever when we went to sleep, when we finally stopped talking. <laughs> and, and now it's over here. Wow, it must be light pretty soon. And if you went outside at night, that is still there. <laughs> the Big Dipper is there. It's been there for at least 6,000 years doing just what it's supposed to. All of the gases and all of those stars just keep burning. I, uh, in this article, uh, MacArthur's book, it said how many millions of tons of energy are expressed from the sun every single second. H and it's still nice. It's, if you stand out today, 
it's a little bit cool, but the sun beating on your face feels just right, being 90 something million miles away, and it doesn't burn out. God is incredible. And, and this just keeps going and going and going. God speaks, things are created. The, the Bible is overwhelming with God being the creator of the heavens and of the earth. And now I want to think about this. There was a time when people knew that God was the creator, that people knew that God was all-powerful. If we look at the book of Joshua, word got around about Israel and that Israel had the real God. And when the spies were sent in to the city of Jericho and they went to Rahab's house, and she talked to them. And they had a huge wall around their city and a big army. But in Joshua chapter 2, verse 8, this is what she said. Before the man lay down, and came, she came up to them on the roof. She hit him on the roof. And she said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land. The Lord? They had gods. No, she's calling their God the Lord. And she says, I know that he's given this land that we live to you. <laughs> and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land will melt away before you. For we heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea. And when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. The people knew who God was because they saw, they witnessed what he did, and they believed him because they saw what he did. And this is what she says, For the Lord your God he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She knew that he made it all. And when he fought for Israel, nobody could stop him because he's God, the real one. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord <laughs> that I have dealt kindly with you and you also deal kindly with me in my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and my sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said, our lives for, uh, for years, even after death. So you save our life, we'll save yours. She knew who God was. And she said, I'm switching sides. No more false gods for me. I'm going with the real one. And so she did. And then in Second Chronicles, Amazing story of Jehoshaphat, a king. And he heard that all these armies were coming after him. So many armies, so many countries, that there was no chance. They were going to be wiped out, all put to death. So what does he do? He looks to the real God, his God, and he prays to the real God. Second Chronicles 5.25, it says, And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. He calls upon God as the creator. You're God up in the sky and everything in the sky, and you're God over every nation and everybody on this earth. So we're calling upon you because you're the one that can do something about all these armies after us. And he said, Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of the land before the people of Israel, and you gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? We saw what you did. We saw your power. And that's the way it always is. God is telling the people of the world, you can see my power by every tree. I keep looking at these trees across the field there that are getting their leaves now. You can see God's power. 
And therefore, you know the real God. He's the one that really is. He's the creator. And he's saying here, you're the real God. You can really do something against these enemies because we can't. And you're the God that helped us before. And we're calling up on you again to do this. And then he tells them, tells all the people, don't be afraid. And do not be dismayed at this great horde of enemy that's coming after us. For the battle is not yours, but is God's. You don't have to worry about fighting this. God is going to fight this for you. And tomorrow, go down against them. And so they do that. Don't be afraid, he keeps telling them. Don't be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. So they do. They go out there, and Jehoshaphat says, I want to put the singers and the choir in the front, where the army usually goes, and the army will be behind them. Well, he's our king, and he called upon God, so... Out in front go the singers. And the singers went down, and they're heading towards where the army is, all these hordes of people. And God did just what he said. He made them all kill each other. So when they went down where their camp was, they see dead bodies. There's nobody to fight. And it took them days to haul in all the stuff that they got, all of the loot, all of the booty. Yes, God did fight for them because they said, you're the creator. You're all powerful. Help us. And God did. And then in the book of Daniel, in chapter 4, we see Nebuchadnezzar. God warned him, you better not think that you made everything because you're only there because God put you there. And everything that you see in your great city, you didn't build it. God did. Well, he gets all proud and arrogant, and a year later, he forgets all that warning from God. And God said, okay, it's going to come true. Nebuchadnezzar's up on his roof, and he says, look at this great place why it was that I made. The great Nebuchadnezzar, and is he still talking? God says, it's happening now. And a few minutes later, he was out in a field on all fours, eating grass like an ox. And he was out there for seven years. And at the end of seven years... In Daniel 4, verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted my eyes to heaven where the real creator is. And my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. There has to be somebody who lives forever. And I don't know how he does it. And I always want to say, God, where did you come from? He didn't come from any, anywhere. He's always here. Not been here, he's always here. Always. There's never been a time where he isn't here. He lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are as counted as nothing. And he does according to his will among all the hosts of heaven and among all the inhabitants of the earth. Whatever God wants to do, he does. Because he's the creator. And none can stay his hand. And nobody will say, God, what have you done? Everything he does is right. Everything he does is perfect. He's God. From generation to generation, the world knows who the real God is until you come to this generation. And the one before us with Darwin saying, oh, there is no God. People saying all the truth All all this, not truth, all all this words about Jesus being God and dying on the cross and rising from the dead in the Bible, that's all fake news. I wouldn't want to be in that man's place standing before God someday. Every moment of history, for billions of years on, he will regret those statements. And at some point, he will bow down to the one who is not fake news, who is the real Jesus Christ. And then something I think very practical for the times that we live in because persecution in the church is increasing all over the world. Uh, Christians are now being slaughtered and put to death in many countries. And in our own country, uh, things are getting much worse. And Peter, uh, 
wrote about persecution because he was writing to people, to Christians, that have been forced from their homes due to persecution and, and spread all over the country. And so Peter's writing to them, trying to give them some instruction of how to behave. And he says, what I want you people to do, I want you to behave according to laws. Do what is right. Don't ever be accused of breaking some law for stealing or doing something wrong. If you're going to be persecuted, let it be for me, for my name's sake. And, and then he tells them, when persecution does come, he tells them in 1 Peter 4.19, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So if we're doing good, we get accused of doing the wrong thing because the world is making laws. That if you declare that God made them male and female, there's parts of the world like Canada for one, and they're trying to do it in this country, that's called a hate crime, and you will pay fines and you will go to prison. You're doing the right thing, and, and we're suffering because of the persecution of people. We're to entrust our souls to our Creator knowing how powerful and strong he is. And still keep doing the good thing, still keep doing the right thing. And it also says in 1 Peter that if you keep entrusting yourself to me, that one of these people torturing you is going to say, tell me about the hope that you have, about a new heavens and a new earth and, and a resurrection if we kill your body. Tell me about that hope. And you could share that person. It says, know the scriptures so you can share the gospel. Say, this is my hope. And that person would get saved. So as we approach a time in history in this country where we didn't think Christians were going to be persecuted, it's already happening. And it's going to happen more. People that are very gross, confused, mixed up sinners. Sinners, because the world has taught them something that's totally ridiculous, that they're no longer a girl, now they're a boy, and they know that Christians say that's wrong, and they interpret that as we hate them. No, we don't. We want to see them come to Christ and be saved in, in eternal, eternal glory forever and ever. So what do they do? They're misled and motivated by this world and spurned on by this world to go and shoot innocent Christians. And then the world says... It's the Christians deserved it because they hate these people and won't let them alone. And all of that is lies. And God says, when you're in a position like that, entrust your soul to the creator. That's a good verse to memorize. Entrusting our soul to the faithful creator. And keep doing good. And don't give up. So God is our creator. He's all powerful. And I need to know that. I need to think about that when I reach situations in my life that seem so impossible. Uh, raising three more kids seems so impossible. <laughs> and at times you're just thinking, how can this be? What have I done? <laughs> and I think, well, God's the almighty creator. I hear stories of other people that got dramatically changed and, and I'm looking for dramatic change from the power of God in these kids. <laughs> Any kids today, they're, they're in a really hard situation. You know, it's, it's hard for kids all the way through history, but nowadays you got people going out of their way to corrupt kids and, and make them sinful, more sinful, to let all their sin just come out and tell them things that are just absurd and insane. Uh, kids have a hard time, but God is able to change people. He's the creator. He made us. He knows all about us. And he knows that when we see him as the creator, that's going to be a big help, a big help in walking with him every day and living for him. So that's my prayer that we will entrust our souls to a faithful creator. He's faithful to us, just as the sun comes up every morning. He is faithful. And he is faithful to help us with whatever we need in life, whatever we're going through. And trust our souls to a faithful creator. Let's pray together.
Father in heaven, we...